just give you a general overview uh, on the geopolitical implications of the shell gas revolution. Sure. Um, the shale gas revolution has really, um, it's been referred to as game changing. Uh, and usually the context in which that is used is when referring to uh, domestic or U.S. domestic natural gas markets. Um, the reason is, is because 10 years ago, most people were projecting the United States to become a major importer of LNG. Uh, and there were a lot of projects that were engaged by, um, you know, the Western integrated majors like ExxonMobil mm -hmm. and Shell and, and Chevron and BP to bring uh, natural gas supplies from North Africa, mm -hmm. from the Middle East, from very distant, distant places to the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, uh, we saw some, some high prices in the early part of the 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, independents, so smaller companies in the United States, were actually venturing into these unconventional shale gas uh -huh. plays and beginning to apply some very interesting upstream process innovation, right. combining hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had a lot of success. And it turns out they made shale gas a commercially viable mm -hmm. alternative. And uh, today, uh, here we sit, you know, not thinking about importing LNG anymore mm -hmm. to the U.S. because we have so much supply that's mm -hmm. been made available. And, of course, what that means is it's pushed all of that development back out into the open water, if mm -hmm. you will. And it's raised the, uh, increased the level of competition by suppliers for access to markets. And uh -huh. You've seen this already have an impact in Europe, mm -hmm. um, where uh, Gazprom has actually had to accept alteration of terms for contract prices for mm -hmm. delivery to Europe because Europeans realize they have other alternatives. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the nature of fungibility and what it means. It has an impact on how gas is priced and it also has an impact through that increase in competition mm -hmm. uh, on, on geopolitics because, you know, as you increase the supply alternatives, it basically means that for example, for, for Russia, their leverage over European foreign policy and, mm -hmm. and, and with regard to satellite countries like Georgia and Ukraine mm -hmm. and Belarus is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. um, going beyond that, when you think about uh, you know what this has meant for uh, the global gas market in general, mm -hmm. uh, by adding fungibility, by adding liquidity, it's putting a lot of pressure on traditional pricing paradigms like oil indexation and uh -huh. changing the nature uh, of the way it's changing the way we think about gas sales abroad, mm -hmm. and so Asia is where this is finally beginning to um, you know come to a head because mm -hmm. you see a lot of competition for access to Asian demand, mm -hmm. um, and all of this has been facilitated by what's been happening on the shale front. Mm -hmm. Um, so that has dramatic implications for you know Middle Eastern petropower mm -hmm. uh, countries like Iran, for example, long term, which were projected to be very important LNG suppliers to the to the global market. Now okay. they're not. Um, uh, has implications for the petropower of states like Venezuela as well, mm -hmm. um, who was projected to become a very important gas supplier long term, and no longer is that the case. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it has had a dramatic impact in terms of the way we think about geopolitical relationships and foreign policy in general. Right. See, from their back is the pump that's pumping the frack fluid. It's typically found anywhere from 12,000 feet to 16,000 feet, depending on where you're at in the basin. Where we're at today, it's typically uh, close to around 13,000 feet uh, below the surface. When Cana was started, this was one of the deepest uh, shell plays to date. Mm -hmm. With that uh, being deeper than other shell plays, there's a lot more challenges to it. Uh, it requires a little bit more technology that's been used in shallower shell plays and we've implemented a lot of those uh, higher technologies here mm -hmm. such as being able to drill 21,000 feet uh, when, the, when the shell is at 16,000 feet. We go down the 16,000 feet and then we'll go horizontal for another mile. Sure, so the U.S. and Canada combined are the fastest growing producers of hydrocarbons in the world, including oil and natural gas liquids. We're adding about a million barrels a day to global supply. Uh, at the current rate, by 2017 or 2018, the U.S. will need to import oil only from Canada and will not need to import oil from other countries. So it'll be pretty energy self-sufficient. Uh, and as part of that process, uh, the U.S. will be pushing out 
uh, oil uh, currently imported from Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Mexico, uh, and other countries. Uh, it will create downward price pressures on the market. Uh, it will enable the United States to have a freedom to pursue a global uh, foreign policy without the uh, without the restrictions associated with oil vulnerability, without uh, the hampered restrictions of uh, having to worry about the relative value of the dollar, which should be significantly stronger. Uh, and in a world of, uh, uh, of zero sum, you know, what we win, someone else loses, there'll be significant losers in the marketplace as well. Politically, they'll tend to be oil producing countries. PGNIG のシェールの現場の近くの街中にある看板です、えー、穴をシェールガスの穴を掘っているところルボチーノという表記がありますあ,あれあれ左側の白いやつあれがシェールガスの塔が見えてきました、うんえー、ルボチーノのシェールガスの井戸に到着しました今、警備員に案内されて、敷地内に入りました。えっ、ー、と、これからシェールガスの井戸に上がります。ますえー、井戸をさらに上に上ります。はい。からえっとジェネレーター発電所とかですね水のタンクポンプ、えー、泥水の分離の処理過程あとコンテナハウスが一望できます。えー、そうこの部分はえっと地上9メートル基礎の部分に当たりまして。えー、ここからさらに上に40メートルほど塔が立っています。えー、井戸の内部に入りました。えー、今まさに、えー、井戸を掘っているその地点に来ております。えー、現在深さはおよそで3キロメートルということです。画面に映っているのが、えー、掘り進めるパイプをつないでいく機械です、えー、この大きな、えー、赤いアームでパ,パイプを挟み込んでで次々突き出していきますはいえー、ここが井戸掘削の制御室です、えー、いろいろなメーターが出てます、えー、ス,イッチスイッチ類もかなり多いです、えー、ポーランド環境省ですそうしますと、えー、実際に、えー、とシェールガスがポーランドのパイプラインの中に流れるのは2014年とか15年頃になるんでしょうか。うん、年ね年、うん、16年16年頃、うん、なるほどね。これました。Dr. Steingraber,、uh, would you summarize why you have opposed the inter introduction of hydraulic flux drain? Yeah, so I oppose、uh, fracking for two reasons. One is that we are unrolling、um, across our landscape an accident prone, highly carcinogenic industry in a place where many, many people live, and that raises risks to our health.、Mm -hmm. The second reason is that we are,、um, because of fracking, we are now. Laying the infrastructure to extract out of 
the deep geological strata of the Earth, mm -hmm. um, a, a fossil fuel that is uh, that contributes to climate change. Mm -hmm. And so this, instead of helping us redesign our economy to decarbonize it, which mm -hmm. we urgently need to do, because fossil fuels are killing the planet and killing ourselves, mm -hmm. instead we are simply continuing the addiction. So for both those reasons, I'm opposed. Okay. Um, and so we are opening up portals of, com of contamination between layers of geological strata, uh -huh. rock that we know contains um, very harmful substances, everything from uranium to benzene to lead to arsenic um, is down there and mm -hmm. when you blow it apart, inject it with toxic chemicals and start that whole world moving, mm -hmm. um, it will uh, come up to the surface um, through uh, routes and fissures and fractures and old abandoned wells in ways that we only dimly understand. Mm -hmm. And the results may be uh, immediate. Uh, to the to us who live near drilling and fracking operations now, or the results may be to the generations of people who follow us. Um, but we have no idea what we are doing, and it, it's simply a, a wrong direction for energy. Mm -hmm. We we know that the task that lies before us. I mean, the best science shows us that the mm -hmm. task required of us now is to immediately decarbonize our economy within two to five years in mm -hmm. order to avoid a catastrophic tipping point, in order to avoid losing our pollination systems, mm -hmm. which our food chain depends on, in order to avoid losing our plankton stocks, which our oxygen supply depends on. And instead of dealing with these urgent problems, we are finding another way to continue the addiction on poisonous fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, too, fracking is the wrong direction for the world. I, I believe that the shale gas revolution is unstoppable because its economic and environmental consequences mm -hmm. are so large and so powerfully positive mm -hmm. for the United States that it will continue. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this is bigger than just the natural gas revolution. Mm -hmm. I see what's going on as the equivalent of each of the past major fuel transitions. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is, when we went from wood to a better fuel, coal, that at the time was cleaner and better and, and more positive and more mobile and mm -hmm. more powerful, um, that sparked and created the fuel necessary. Mm -hmm for the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. which lifted people to unforeseen new heights mm -hmm. and standards of living. Mm -hmm. And then the next, it happened once again uh, as a result of all the innovation around oil in World mm -hmm. War II. And once again, to unforeseen new levels mm -hmm. and even the global society that we have today. Mm -hmm. Because oil was lucky to come along at the time of the IT revolution, mm -hmm. you combine all that and we have a globalized society. Mm -hmm. But now as natural gas displaces both coal and oil, I see that happening one more time. Mm -hmm. And once again, we'll be lifting all civilization to unforeseen new heights. Mm -hmm. And I see it as an incredible benefit for the world as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you.